Hi everyone, my name is Flavius Sterchuk and welcome back to Pursuit of Freedom. This episode, we have uh, the lovely Semida Moldovan and her daughter Ada Antochi. Uh, in the past, I've had an opportunity just to say accomplishments about the guest. But this being a unique and different episode, I actually had them each write about the other person. And so I'm going to read what they wrote about each other. Um, and so let's go for it. This is uh, Semida to Ada. My firstborn, when I had Ada, I thought the whole world needed to know that I brought a human into this world. I was like, wow, a gentle, soft, and innocent child. A child that every parent dreams and wishes to have. With no exaggeration, that was Ada. She matured so quickly as she was so needed in our new way of living after arriving in the States. She helped us with navigating through language barriers and she never showed signs of unhappiness or unwillingness to help. She is a person that can't say no to anybody. She grew up a young lady that loves God. She dedicated her life to Christ when she was 18. She participated in mission trips, and she is an absolutely amazing daughter, loving sister, wonderful wife, and an amazing mother to her two boys. She is so loved by all of her friends and coworkers. She is a full-time business owner as a transaction coordinator for realtors. In her busy life, she also makes time to be a part of regular Bible studies. She trains at CrossFit five days a week, nearly every morning. And she dedicates her evenings and weekends to her family doing fun things. She cares for those around her and she's a great listener. She jumps to help even though she may not have enough time in her busy schedule. This is Ada, my firstborn. This is my daughter that I crossed the border with, holding her in my arms for a better life. She is a part of the reason we decided to pursue our dream of freedom. I am so proud and honored and grateful for my daughter. And now, this is what Semida, uh, what Ada wrote about Semida, her mother. Semida is my beautiful, vibrant mom. She is the strongest, most inspirational person I know. She is a mother of four, a grandmother to three boys, my boys and then their cousin. Not only is she the best mom and grandmother, but she is my best friend, a business owner, marathoner and ultra marathoner 91 marathons 19 boston qualifiers finisher of the six major marathons she's also in the guinness book of world records for running the tokyo marathon her sixth major start my mom who wholeheartedly gives and cares for all those around her her life has been full of ups and downs joy and tragedy yet she's taken it all in and really lived. Her story and the way she lives her life inspires me, and I hope it helps others to see the value of what she and my dad worked so hard for. That's so awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much to both of you for being willing to do this. I know it's not easy reliving difficult moments, learning about difficult moments, so I just want to say thank you guys for doing this. This is very important. Is there anything you guys want to say before we dive into this? Thank you for this chance to share the stories that we have, and we're very excited about it. Yes, thank you, Flavius, and your crew for uh, working so hard this morning to get this um, thing done. Thank yeah. you. It's our it. pleasure. It's our pleasure. Well, should we dive in? Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> well, what better place to start than the beginning? Semida, would you share with us your first memory in Romania? I believe I was around 13 or 14 years old. Um, uh, so clear to me there was a Sunday, it was very quiet. Uh, usually the street that I lived on, it's been a lot of motion, a lot of noise. But that day, um, it was so quiet and I, I just found a time to go on the hill which is just behind my house and I, I climbed the hill and from there I saw 
the whole street, my, my whole world and life that I had. And for some reason, I, I wasn't satisfied or, and I said to God, I said, it must be more than this. I wanted more, but I didn't ask God for more. I just remember saying that it must be more than this. And this memory stuck with me for years and years, although I was probably not too young. I'm sure I had more memories than that, but let's yeah, go on. That is beautiful. Can you tell us about your childhood and teenage years? Basically, what was life like growing up in Romania? I was born in Baia Mare, um, northern part of the country. Um, I have two brothers, so I'm the only girl in the family. My childhood was... It was pretty good. I had a pretty fun and good uh, childhood. We grew up on a street with a lot of kids, pretty much everyone close in age. We did have a lot of uh, chores and uh, work to do. I remember we used to walk to school. It would be about two miles. We always made it fun, no matter what, uh, with the kids. I believe I was in middle school when um, I was recruited in a sense, uh, in a um, sport. So I started running, I was very young in my uh, life. So with that, I had the opportunity uh, seeing the country, our country. We were not able to leave the country back then. At home, we used to help our parents. Um, Every day we'll have chores, we'll come from school, get out of our uniforms, put on a regular clothes and just do work around the house. And from what you remember, what was everyday life like in communism? I mean, that had to affect everyone in different ways, but also similarly at the same time. We, we felt, even as young kids, we felt the system, the oppression. Uh, there was a lot of restrictions. Things started to um, get worse in the 80s. I remember as kids, our parents would have us um, go and stay in line for uh, food, especially um, milk, eggs, butter, so and bread. These will be items that they were not, um, haven't been easy to be found. So you have to lie down very early in the morning and then stay in line. And sometimes you don't get to buy those things. Sometimes it will be short that day and there's no more left. So you have to come again. What was your family life like? What was the dynamics of parents? What did they do for work? And, um, what did you and your siblings do? My father worked uh, in a mine when he started working uh, in a mine when he was 15. He worked for a coal mine for 15 years. Then he was diagnosed with um, silicosis and he had to stop working in the mine. So he started working in a lumber yard and we as kids had to help him. Um, after uh, school, he will take us, especially me and my oldest brother. We will go in the wood with him. He will cut the whole tree and we have to help him. He will measure and we will cut and then split the wood. And then in the fall, he will have to sell the wood for families that need it for a fire. Wow. My mom was the most neatest and cleanest person I ever knew. She will sell tickets on a bus as a um, public transportation. Oh, okay. So that was her job for um, many years, but she will make sure that we as kids will have everything ready for the morning to go to school. We will look good for that day. There was no, no exception. So I remember very well that um, she will, her schedule will be on, on the route that we lived and that will be for a full month. So that month uh, I will have to be at the bus station at a certain time 
ready for her. She will take five minutes to braid my ponytails and uh, have me ready for school. So I will uh, get off the bus the next station where the school was. Normal family stuff. Normal. In the midst of not normal life. I did want to also ask you, what was life like as a Christian for you and your family in a communist country? So I did grow up in a Christian family. My grandparents on both sides were Christians. Um, my mom and my dad were Christians. Um, the oppression on that side um, from the system was because we were not Orthodox. We were Pentecostals. And our way of worship and um, it was so conservative and so obvious to the others that we were very much um, ridiculized and, and mocked and people were not looking at us as uh, bright and smart and capable. So it was difficult, especially when you're young and you have dreams and you hope that one day you will do something good with your life. It's just ruined into it doesn't help with yeah. confidence. With confidence, correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I also wanted to ask you, Samida, if you could share a little bit about your husband Vio's childhood. My husband comes from a family of, there were seven siblings. Um, he was born in um, Kumpen, Alba Iulia, more central of um, Romania. His mom was from Kumpen. My father-in-law, his dad, uh, Vio's dad, was from uh, my hometown, from Baia Mare. So they lived there for a couple of years. His dad was a, a policeman. Oh. So he had a, a good offer back in the um, town that he was born. Vio, when I met him, he was a watchmaker. So Vio, the strong, the macho man, um, what fascinated me the most about him as we were married um, is perfection and diligence that he will work with mechanical watches. Oh, interesting. He will work on those little watches like uh, putting all these small pieces together and at the end, he will call me and say, come and, and see how it starts. It's almost like I haven't seen heart surgery, but we've seen movies where it's mm -hmm. just give a little bit bit of a... And that's how watches work. You know, say, come and see how it starts. And just put a gentle touch and it's alive. Which leads me to how did you guys meet? So we met in church. Baia Mare, our um, church, um, he followed me after one sermon um, and he told me that he has a book that he borrowed from one of my cousins. So this is how we started talking and then he walked with me to the bus station and we started talking more and um, we started seeing each other. Uh, through the week, there was no communication through phones or anything else. It was just by word. Let's meet next week. It's so on a certain time, and that's how we. And and what drew you to him? What made him stand out? Uh, Vio was very confident in his skin. <laughs> <laughs> Vio was a young man with an absolute strong self-esteem. And I think I lack on that by then, back then. And I, for some reason, I thought that, that that's something that will complete mm -hmm. me. Now, what did your parents think of him? Because that could, that could <laughs> go either way. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, what your what did your parents think when they first met him and thought of it about you dating and all that? Um, my father loved Vio. First time when he 
So when they met, they connected, they had so many things in common. So it was easy and no problem at all. Now, my mom, on the other hand, <laughs> uh, Vio was not the man that my mom dreamed her daughter will marry or date. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but she warmed up to him in time. Um, and she actually learned to respect him, love him, and actually see the true um, character that Ray had. What was your first year of marriage like? Uh, our first years of marriage in the U.S. here, are, our issues are different than the issues you had. Uh, our struggles are different. I mean, we live in a free country here. Romania was not. Um, so what was that transition like for you? Well, we met in March of 87, and we got married in November of 87. So a very short time to get to know someone. And we, of course, brought a lot of unknown in our marriage. But I have to say, it wasn't extremely difficult. It was probably because we were busy with work. We always knew that marriage is uh, a commitment, a sacrifice. And we both agreed that that's what we want to do. And of course, we loved each other. and. Um, we got pregnant right away, um, yeah, but of course it wasn't easy. I mean, it's first year, you have to learn about that person, a lot of things, and the family and everyone else around you, so. Samida, how did Vio tell you he is wanting to escape the country? How did you feel about it when he first approached you about it? So we, we had a Ada. September 88 and that was um, we had her for her dedication a couple of weeks after and we had a big celebration family over we uh, celebrated our daughter and I remember that evening after everyone left um, we put Ada to sleep then Ray started talking with me and he said have you ever thought of leaving Romania and I said yes I have but now we have a family now we have a child I I don't know if it's possible but I had my thoughts were about leaving Romania even before we were married so we talked about it and we both agreed that we can have a better life and a better future for our kids if we try to escape. What was your initial thought once it started, once the idea came into both of your heads? What, what were you feeling? Were you feeling fear or excitement or hope? I don't know about excitement. I was for sure scared. I mean, we knew because those were the times that people were leaving. Almost every day you will hear that somebody left the city. So you're just scared, but you're so, so determined and so willing to do something better with your life. And the fact that things were so bad in Romania made so many people make this decision. Before we get too far into the story, this amazing story, I um, we are currently in Vio's man cave. I wish everyone could see how amazing this room is, but um, I know that Vio is not with us anymore. And so Ada, I wanted to give you an opportunity to share a little bit about that. And uh, thank you for being willing to do that. Sure. So just over two years ago, my dad had a paragliding accident. Um, he loved to fly and um, was really passionate about it. And unfortunately, we lost him, but he died doing what he really truly loved. Um, yeah. You know, 
he, yeah, he wouldn't have picked anything different. Um, I think he really truly lived his life. No, thank you. I, I know it's difficult to yeah, it's express all that, but before uh, we get into Samida's story, um, I thought it would be really important for us to hear part of Vio's story. I mean, he is the reason your family is here. And so I thought it'd be really honoring to share and hear a little bit about that. Would you mind? Sure. Um, so his story we've gotten from my mom, grandparents, family members, the family friend that went with him. Um, so I know that they left. Well, so it started, you know, the the atmosphere at the time was very hostile to, you know, even you didn't know who you could trust, who you could talk to. Um, and I know that my mom and her friend had been talking about it. And so my dad had approached her friend's husband and said, hey, have you ever thought of leaving? And he was a little cautious at first, didn't really admit to anything. He said, I don't know what you're talking about. Wasn't sure exactly kind of what my dad was getting at, essentially. And then he, they planned a dinner, had some more conversations, you know, really truly got to know each other. They were neighbors in Chikudlo. Um, and they ended up deciding, he said on New Year's Eve, that they were gonna make this decision and fully commit to this plan. Wow. And so in about springtime around March, they decided to go. They were able to get the funds needed to um, pay the guide. And they really made a good partnership together because um, his friend knew that it, he saw my dad as somebody who was strong and willing and like trustworthy and wouldn't leave him behind if something got you know out of hand or they got into trouble. So he knew that he would be in good hands with him. And they, he just said it was a good mutual trust relationship. And so somebody that you could do something like this with. So the plan was that they would take the train to a bordering town and from there they would walk. The experience wasn't, they didn't run into any guards or any issues necessarily with that. It's just that it was a long, hard walk. Um, the guide was ahead of them about a hundred meters, he said, just to be able to give him a signal if something was wrong, if they saw a guard or a soldier or somebody um, to tell them to run and it just kind of had, that was their plan. Um, so as soon as they got through the border, his friend said that, my dad said, I feel free as a bird. And they kept going. And um, that's when they had met, connected with the other part of the guide it was his brother who had a big uh, van that actually had a whole group of them. So it wasn't just them two, there were three or four others. And they continued on to Belgrade, but they um, had a connection in Austria. So my dad's plan was to continue to go to Austria and meet their friend there. And so they had this big van. He said they were in the trunk of this van, no care about safety seat belts or anything like that. They all just crammed in there and they kept going. And um, there was this huge line. It was like a truck stop at the border. So it's where all the semi trucks would go through. And um, they decided to leave their bag. They didn't have much of a luggage. He said they decided to leave their bags and just took their IDs and started walking. And they said, maybe we'll blend in, look like the truck drivers and just start walking. And notice nothing was, you know, they weren't running into any issues until they ran into a border patrol guard. And at gunpoint, he stopped them, had them turn around and go back. And that's when he brought them to the police and they were in prison. That experience, according to my dad's friend, wasn't a bad one necessarily. Um, they were treated okay um, as far as prison is concerned, but there was a part that did put a lot of fear in them in that they would take somebody every day out of the big group of them that there were, like 30 of them, take one guy, beat him, and then you weren't sure where he was after that, if he came back or if he was sent back to Romania. They didn't know. So they stayed in suspense for what I heard it was 18 days and my dad's friend was let go first on a weekend and then my dad was after that on the following Monday he was let go and told you're free to go mom did I miss anything uh, what I will add to um, 
this, as I remember my conversation with the VO, was that, um, yes, the suspension was really um, difficult being held there with no any type of information, any knowledge of what's going to happen with them and what's going on outside the that room. Um, for all these people being there for days, um, it was really difficult. And they will be, as we heard, uh, they will be taken one by one, being interrogated or, or even beaten. And I remember Vio telling me that through that room, there was a, a small window. They all could look, and there was a bus. They will only every day will, they will see a bus. They will see people handcuffed getting into the bus. So that was a, a clear indication that they were taken back to the Romanian border. Wow. That was very painful and hard for them to see because they never knew. I mean, they never knew who's going to be next and. So, like Ada mentioned, uh, Vio's friend um, got off out on a Friday. Of course, I didn't know about that until later. And uh, yes, uh, Vio spent the weekend in the same cell. At that point, there were just two people left. It was Vio and another person. And what Vio felt as he was telling me when we met, he went through the emotions and the fear and the prayer that he actually put in front of God to, to see what would be his um, destiny. It, it was really hard. So at this point, you have no idea he's in prison. You haven't had heard a word from anyone. How long had it been since you had communicated with him? So since he left in March, the end of March, we, we, we spoke before he left a little bit, kind of planning, thinking this is how things are going to develop. This is how things are going to go with us. He will go and then me and Ada will um, come after three, four years. That was the rumor that people will reunite within this time. It wasn't always the case. Sometimes it will take longer, sometimes shorter. It depends on, on the case. But we didn't want to exchange too much information because we always knew whoever is left behind, they will be interrogated. It will be, it, you look suspicious and you are part of some type of plan. So we want to leave it to the minimum information. And we always knew that if we get a chance to um, speak again together our conversation through the phone they were uh, listened to uh, it will have to be also as minimum and as discreet as possible so for a, almost a month I was wandering and walking going to work and the first two weeks I was not uh, suspicious of anything but then his uh, co-workers was, were looking for him and asking. He wasn't showing up at work, so they start checking. And then, of course, eventually they came to me. And I was taken into the um, police office, and, and they interrogated me, and they started asking questions. And, of course, my answer was always no. I did not know. I did not know everything, but I did know that he left. But I had to say no. Uh, the train that will take from his village to Bayamare, where we both work, it was a very short ride, 15 minutes on the train. We used to hop on the train before he left and just go to work. Um, and that train station will be the one that Every day, I will see young men getting off the train, handcuffed, with their faces down, being so humbled and embarrassed. And, and you can make eye contact, or you can make gestures of, 
um, any kind of emotions because the guards are trolling constantly. I uh, do remember um, Leo's friend that was already out called his wife and she came to me letting me know that Leo is okay, he's alive, but he's still in prison and we have to pray for him. At that point, there were two people left in that cell over the weekend with not knowing what was their destiny the following week. Either being sent back to Romania or, or freedom. Freedom, yes, yes. Wow. So how did you how did you survive those months in the unknown uh, with a one year old uh, in Romania with zero information? Obviously, you're just you. All you can do is pray and hope. Of course, once um, the authorities found out that um, Leo left the country, I was taken into a um, police station, Securitatea, as we call it. Um, I lost my job right away. I was working as an insurance agent at the time. I had help with Ada because I had my mom and my mother-in-law that uh, both offered to help. So I will go in town in city and try to find work, which I knew that it's not going to be easy or even possible because they knew at that point uh, if somebody's looking for work, it's because a husband left the country. So. And what did your boss at work tell you why you're fired? What was their explanation? Yeah, so my, my boss, actually, um, when they found out why I'm taking into the um, interrogation, I um, came back and they told me that I have to pick up my things, and I did. And, of course, he approached me and asked me if I knew that my husband left. And I said no. And he, at that point... Um, He thought that my husband left me behind or didn't care for me or our daughter. So he just gave me a pat on my back saying, oh, you'll be fine. You're young. You, you'll find somebody. It's just, and you just keep your mouth shut and endure whatever humiliation you're put through and keep going. So did you end up finding another job to provide for you and your daughter? No, no. But again, I was uh, um, blessed to have uh, my mother-in-law and uh, Vio's family and my parents um, helping us. At what point did you realize or come to the conclusion that it's your turn now and you have to escape? So after Vio um, was free, um, again, he contacted me through the phone. It will be a public phone that you have to make arrangement to get there and how you communicate. What so, was your, sorry for the interruption, what was that first conversation like? You hadn't heard from him in a month. <laughs> what, when you finally heard his voice, how did you feel and what was that like? I, I don't quite remember emotions. Of course, I I was happy to hear his voice and know that he's alive, first of all, and then that he's free and there's a chance for us and our family to have a better future. So yes, I was excited, but you don't do that stuff over the phone when somebody's listening. You, you focus and concentrate on what's next. I believe we, we started talking a little bit about switching what we initially thought it's going to happen because Vio being already in Yugoslavia he he knew that um, 
it's going to be a long period of time in order for me and Ada to get to our destination, which we initially thought is going to be Australia. Wow. And uh, at that point, he told me, look, the plan changed. Um, I will do everything in my power to have you come over here because a lot of bad things are happening. I hear a lot of rumors about family splitting up because they are separated. And this is not what I want for our family. So he was very clear on that. And he asked me if I agree. And I said, yes, I will do that. And how did your parents feel about when you, about you wanting to escape to join him? How did they feel when you first approached them, say, hey, this is my plan? Oh, by the way, I also have to take my one-year-old with me. Um, I, I didn't tell everybody that we planned to leave too. So only my mom and my oldest brother knew that I'm uh, actually going to approach this. So... Yeah, I didn't tell my in-laws, I didn't tell any of my other siblings, so it was just my mother. So could you t walk us through the steps of how you came up with your plan and who were you with and that sure. process? Sure. So again, um, Ray made arrangements, Bill made arrangements uh, for me to um, leave and somehow get to Yugoslavia, where he was already uh, in a refugee camp. So I left Ada with my mom one evening. Um, I went to the train station, which will be the very last um, train from Bayamare to Timisoara. It was the last train will be around 11 p.m. Um, I remember I went to the train station, ready to hop on a, on a train. I got my ticket, a small bag with me. And waiting there, I, I couldn't do it. I, I couldn't think how I'm going to be without my baby. So I did not go on that train. There was no more buses at that hour. Um, so I took a taxi. Um, this man took me to a route that was not straight to my mom's house where I wanted to go. And I knew the city, I, I know every single street. And I was scared and I was shy and I, I said, why are you going this way? And he started talking things and just wanted to see, I don't know what, in the city. And he started talking about what if, you know, him and I stop somewhere. So I was shaking and I was very scared and I said, if you don't stop the car, I'm going to jump. Cars back then didn't have anything out of power. And so you had to actually pull the, the lock. And do. So I, I was already with my hand on the handle of the car and he, he stopped. He stopped and he let me go. And I remember I ran. It was May. I, it was raining so hard. And I ran. And my mom opened the door. And I couldn't stop crying. so humiliating and so hard to talk about this. He 
So next day I had to go and call Theo and I told him, I'm so sorry, I, I couldn't leave Ada behind. And he was not mad, he was not upset, he said, no problem, it's okay. I'll, I'll work things out so you and Ada can come. So at this point, you and Vio are communicating, um, trying to come up with a new plan. Um, would you share that with us? What did you guys come up with on how to get you and your baby across the border? So the new plan was, um, I had Vio's brother, older brother, George, come with me to the next uh, phone call that we had. And he asked Vio if he can help him as well to escape. And he will help me with Ada through our journey. And Vio agreed. And that was our plan. And so um, now, can you share that story with us on how it went and what it was like? going through that whole journey with while carrying a baby <laughs> yes um, it was June 18 June I will always remember that day so we planned with um, my brother-in-law and his wife um, we had a, a family event in Vios uh, village and somehow I was supposed to bring Ada as well there. But we knew that if I do, it's going to be questions. Why um, can I stay with them over the weekend? And because they love to have Ada over. So we decided not to bring Ada to the event. So we, we were pretty good at um, having fun to the engagement of one of your sister that day. But we find excuses that Ada wasn't quite well. And so that evening, I went back home to my mom's house. I picked up Ada in my bag and my brother-in-law and another friend of his that um, was part of the group. And we, we actually took a car. So we drove to... Timishwara, where we were supposed to meet with others um, as planned by Vio and his connections. So we got in Timishwara in the morning. We left in the afternoon. It was a long, long drive in the car, so early the next day we were in Timishwara. We go into this apartment where is this um, sister from church, very unsuspicious, very unknowledgeable, kind of, yeah, and she harbors a lot of people in her apartment. People that are about people to that are escape. about to escape gotcha. from all over the country. We we didn't know each other at that point. It was just me and my brother-in-law and his friend, and of course Ada with me. So all the other people, we were ten at that point, ten people waiting. So by evening, a new person shows up and is telling us, "Okay, this is what's gonna happen." You and you and you will go into the first car that it's lined up at the entrance. You and you and you will go in the next car and the next group in the third car. There were three cars. All you have to know is if we're caught, we're all going coming from a wedding that took place in a certain town here and we're all going home. And home is next city close by that was planned if we're not getting caught nobody's talking anything nobody's 
stopping anywhere but where, when the car stops that's when you guys jump out of the car in the field it was a corn field so we followed the instructions and that's what we did um, the car stopped within a couple of meters from each other not very far and we all um, got out of the car as quick as we could and just enter into the field of corn. I remember we somehow we gathered together talking with our uh, main guide that was supposed to take us to the other side of the border. Um, at that point it was around 11 p.m. Ada was okay. She was in my arms and sleeping. I had a small bag across with a couple of things that I put for her changes, change of clothes for me and her. Um, I remember I, Vio told me on the phone, make sure you get a, a brand new pair of shoes. You'll need it for a good walk, so they have to be good shoes. So we started walking. There were fields of corn and then there were open fields with nothing. There was something planned, but I can't recall what was it. And I remember we left the main road and we saw a couple of lights and we're making our way through the fields. It was getting late and Ada got uncomfortable and started to cry starting being fussy and as as babies do as <laughs> baby do and so at that point people were starting to getting agitated it's like what's going on can somebody make that baby stop crying it's <laughs> like so um i got very nervous and uncomfortable and i felt so bad and I, I I stopped and I told my brother-in-law, I said, look, I'm, I'm probably it's best for me just to turn back and because I don't want to risk anybody from here. Well, people were coming to us. It's like, make that baby stop crying. It's like, we, we're going to get caught. We're, we're in big danger. And um, my brother-in-law was, no, no. We, we need to give her the medication that we had. So we did have some sleeping pills with us that I was hoping that I won't have to use it. But at that point, uh, those people were so, so scared. So I decided to, to give Ada the pill. But what I did, I remember that I had a little tiny pill. I can recall what was it, but it was a sleeping pill given by a nurse. She knew that it's not life-threatening it was just gonna help her sleep better than <laughs> in her bed hopefully for a while <laughs> for a while so i remember i i tried to chew the pill a little bit with my feet and then put it into her little mouth just to make sure that you know with a little milk that i had in a small bottle so i guess she fell asleep <laughs> she slept the whole way but I wanted to say that um, we walked for probably six hours, all kind of fields. I remember going through a canal with dirt. It wasn't much mud or anything bad. I remember we had to cross over a big uh, metal pipe it was huge it was big and we couldn't stand and walk we we just had to go on our belly and just crawl kind of over the the thing so my brother-in-law took turn and he will hold ada and then um i carried her and then his friend carried her 
she was sleeping. She was okay. Um, we got lost. This uh, person the, took us to the border. He stopped at one point and we all looked at him. So what's what's happening now? And he hesitated for a couple of seconds and then he said, I think we're lost. I don't know exactly where we are. How did you feel when you heard that? <laughs> You don't feel good when you mm -hmm. don't know where you are. And you actually, you have no idea. Even when you think somebody guiding you knows where you are, you mm -hmm. don't know where you are. So he find his way somehow and we finally see the borderline. And here's a long line of um, fence barbed wire so I said okay this is it this is the border Romania Yugoslavia so we start digging they made us dig a little bit under the uh, barbed wire so we can go under the patrol will go every 10 minutes or every 15 minutes from one post to the next where we were, we were not very close to one of those uh, towels, but we could see a little light in the distance. So we were told to dig, and not a lot, but just enough so we don't get caught with our clothes in the bob wire. So we made it under, one by one, got under. And I do remember once we were on the other side, our guide said, now I want you all to turn and look back because this is the last time you're going to see Romania this way. Wow. So from there we um, kept on going and it was getting light outside. It was summer. Um, could have been around 5.30 to almost 6 a.m. because I was in a distance again, we'll see houses in Yugoslavia, especially um, villages. Houses were not very close to each other. They will have big properties, people. So I will see a house in a distance, but to the next one, it will be another mile or probably more um, but I could hear roosters <laughs> it was morning um, so our guide he needed to go out on the street and look for the cars that were supposed to come and pick us up but because we wasted time and we got lost for a little bit he wasn't sure if they're there he came back and he said, I, I think they're gone, but I'm hoping they will be back. But you, and then he turned to me and he said, you, you can take your daughter and start walking because all the others wanted to keep going to Austria. They had the same destination. They didn't want to live in Yugoslavia, stay in Yugoslavia, it was too risky but you already have your husband here. So you're okay. You just have to walk. You don't have to say anything to anyone. People here see these things almost every day and someone might take you and take you to the police station. All you have to say is say Belgrad and they will know where to take you. He assured me that I'll, I'll be fine, I'll be safe, nothing is going to be going wrong. Uh, I do remember that I changed my clothes because we were already dirty and muddy and, and I put on a dress that I had with me and I said goodbye to my brother-in-law and he wished me luck and I said the same thing to him and I just started walking. 
on an empty street with dogs and probably a rooster here and there and and walking I remember that I I I, I see a car coming towards me so my heart started beating really hard but it passes me it passes me it didn't stop and another one and it didn't stop so I, I just keep going I just keep walking and then 10 minutes later I see this car coming from behind and stop next to me and it's this guide our guide it just gets out of the car and he looks at me and said you're a lucky woman <laughs> <laughs> so apparently the cars that were supposed to wait for us waited it and then they made their way back to the uh, border and pick up all the other people and I got in one of the cars and uh, <clears throat> I remember so well that that driver um, he was driving and he was turning and he was like Mamma mia. And then <laughs> keep driving and again turning and say, Mamma mia. <laughs> I don't know what made them think that it's so curious yeah. or so strange or, or yeah that Well did did Ada wake up eventually? <laughs> not not at that point. She was still sleeping. Wow. <laughs> she was still so sleeping. Still worked. Yes. Really good. <laughs> so uh we drove for hours it could have been three hours if not longer and next stop was in Belgrade at the refugee camp uh, where the driver and the guide said okay so this is where Vio is and someone comes to me and said so who are you looking for and I said you're a Moldovan Oh, yes, yes, uh, he's, he's in the class, he's taking English classes, but let me go and, and see if I can get him out. We all came and Ada was still sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a good, good moment. What did, uh, what did he do when he saw you guys? He hugged us, he was happy. He, Took Ada and he said, "What'd you do to my baby?" <laughs> I don't know. I can't remember what he said, but it was it was a good moment. It was really really nice to be reunited with yeah. our little family. Then, what did you guys do next? Uh, you obviously went back to the refugee camp. Um, how long were you there? What was life like in a refugee camp? Um, would you mind sharing about that? Sure. Um, so yes, we we um, ended up going to the refugee camp. Um, I think the following day, Vio took me to the immigration to report that his wife and baby were with him. Now there was another process, paperwork for me, and um, to be registered the classes and whatever was going on in the camp. Refugee camp in uh, Belgrade was okay. We, we knew that it's temporary. We knew that it's not something permanent and we could for sure easily deal with whatever was going on. So nothing bad, um, horrific happened. The camps were actually there offered by the United States. There were for sure some, some orders that they were supposed to function and operate. Now you're in Europe, this is different. They don't always follow rules and regulations. So food wasn't great, especially when it comes to, to feed a baby, a child. I remember milk was so limited. It would be a very small cup of milk and it didn't even have the color of the milk. So Vio and others will try to work to provide extra money for food and to 
to have something for us to be able to, because we didn't know how long it's going to take for us to leave um, the refugee camp. I remember we were transferred from, Bud uh, from Belgrade to a different refugee camp, somewhere more remote area. It was harder because there was absolutely nothing to do there. Absolutely nothing. In Belgrade, we had a big city. We could go and communicate with our family, phone calls. Did they say why they transferred you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Apparently, Vio was um, still involved in helping other Romanian crossing the border. Oh, wow. Um, uh, yes. So it was a punishment. They will transfer you to worst camp to stay there and you're pretty much isolated there's absolutely nothing to do no work for Vio no food was okay there but nothing to do nothing and just wait we stayed there for about a month and then Vio found his way with connection to take us back to Belgrade <laughs> Which I I imagined he would he, he has a lot of connections. So we stayed in a refugee camp in a small room uh, with two twin-sized beds. And the room literally was <clears throat> two twin-sized beds on each wall. And in between will be two nice stands. I don't... There was no kitchen, for sure. There was not. We will go and eat in a common area. And if you want to make something extra, you will borrow something from the next door. At that time, we kind of got to know each other, the next door family or couple or whoever was there. But what was really difficult was that many times we had to share our room with another person. Imagine it wasn't easy for a family of three to squeeze in a small bed and make room for a strange person, which we greatly accommodate because he was going through the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so how long did you end up staying in a refugee camp overall? So I, I got there in June and we were granted visa for United States in uh, November. I mentioned that our initial plan was Australia. Um, by the time VO was offered uh, the interview, Australia embassy was closed. It was not accepting any more refugees. So our two options were Canada and United States. So for me, it was really difficult because um, I knew a lot of people from our hometown that immigrated to Australia, and I had a, a family there, a cousin. So, but we had to make a decision. So we decided that uh, United States would be our choice and and did they tell you where in the United States? Not, not then. So when we were granted the visa, when we were um, asked to go to the office and pick it up, that's when we found out that a, a Catholic church in St. Louis, Missouri, was our sponsor. And that day of November the 30th of 89, that will be our flight to St. Louis. And at this point, did you know of anyone in the United States? Any connection? Any relative, distant relative? Anything? No relatives, but um, people that we met through the camp all this month, uh, some of them already left before us. So we kept in touch with them. The minute they arrived in the States, they sent us their phone numbers and we 
will be able to connect with them regardless where we will be mm-hmm. in the States. Wow. So what was it like boarding the plane knowing you're, you've kind of, you, you've succeeded in your pursuit of freedom? You're leaving the past behind and heading into a new a new life basically you know how did your how did you and Vio feel was it overwhelming or you still had doubts that it would still happen you know like, how did you guys feel as the the day came to board the plane well we were definitely excited nervous but excited finally we got a visa and we got tickets to fly and it was first flight for Vio and first for Ada. Um, but yes, we were excited to, to go on that big Panam. I remember it was two-story plane. And it would be a smoking area in the back, <laughs> <laughs> ironically. And um, Ada had so much fun because she was able to climb the steps, and move in the plane a little bit. Uh, they were both sick, Ada and Vio. They didn't like the flight, but it did not matter. We knew that it's temporary, even the flight. Wow. What a story. So what were your first few years like in the U.S.? I mean, it's a different kind of survival. You you don't speak the language. You don't know anyone. You, you're in Missouri, <laughs> of all places, too. <laughs> You know, it's not it's not like uh, New York or some big city. It's it's you know St. Louis, Missouri. Um, so, um, what was it like? You know, what? How did you guys make it? Uh, so we arrived in St. Louis, Missouri airport, and we knew that somebody has to wait for us this way. And yes, there was a person, a lady, with a. Um, our name written on a big board, Moldovan family. And we spotted her, we went and saw her. We were so happy to see that somebody's actually waiting for us. So she took us to our, she was actually a um, third generation Romanian. Oh, wow. Child, but she was an older person and um, she speak very little Romanian, but enough to have a good communication. So she took us in her car um, and she was so excited that she decided to take us and see uh, toward the, the downtown St. Louis and see the R. Wow. We were not interested. We were so tired and <laughs> we were so sick. But yeah, she was so nice and kind. And so we got in an apartment with um, two boxes with food. We had a queen size mattress, nicely um, made with clean sheets and cover for us. And our lady Mary told us that someone will come in the morning to take care of us. So the next morning, um, somebody did came to our door um, I can't remember exactly how many people came, but definitely and wonderful, wonderful people that's smiling and happy to help and took us to different offices to get us our paperwork ready and in order and uh, give us more information about the city and we're going to be in that apartment for at least a month uh, that they purchase already for us, I mean, being paid Mm -hmm. for it. And we'll have to reimburse the company, the agency that sponsored us in time, which will be payments, which was great. We gladly accepted that. They started helping Vio with finding a job. He did shortly after, probably within a week, he found a job as a mechanic. Uh, The wages back then were $4.25. $4.25. He was happy. I will be home with Ada uh, pretty much all day. 
after a week we learn our way to the laundry mat and we will walk both of us there do laundry come back and walmart was not far from us and we will walk there and do a little shopping i do want to mention that when we arrived in the states we had 50 dollars with us that was our budget that's all we had 50 dollars and first thing that Vio wanted to purchase, he needed so badly a mirror to shave. Mm -hmm. There was somehow in that bathroom, there was no mirror. So I still have that little mirror with me. No way. Did you guys have any hopes or dreams, things that you uh, or that Vio wanted to do right away, you know, in a new world, our new country, a new life? Um, what kind of things were you guys talking about back then? So two weeks after we arrived, the revolution in Romania started. Everyone, every Romanian that we already met at church, which was like 50 miles away, we started going now. It would be probably a second Sunday that we've been contacted by some brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. knew that someone came in St. Louis. At that point, people were confused, trying to make decision. Do we go back? Do we stay? And I, I said, let's go back. Things are going to be better now. Let's go back to our families. I'm, I miss my mom. I miss. And Ray Vio was like, no, we are <laughs> not going back. We are here to stay. This is what we want to do, and this is what we're going to do. Wow. Yes, he made the right decision, and I did not object after mm -hmm. that. Uh, we got our first car as a gift from a brother in Union, in Missouri. It was, uh, all I know, it was a station wagon. It was a very old car, <laughs> but we were so appreciative for it. We used that car for many years after we drove in that car 2,500 miles all the way to Seattle. We had a um, <clears throat> flat tire in Pocatello, Idaho. We slept in the car in um, some rest area. We ate McDonald's and Wendy's and Twinkies, <laughs> but we were together. Our plan was to leave St. Louis because um, we didn't, the climate, it was not what we could tolerate. It was so different than Romania. And we, at that point, were in contact with <coughs> our friends from uh, the refugee camp. And they told us about Washington and Oregon State. So we decided, we said, Let's go and explore. We don't like Washington, Oregon, driving through California, Texas. And we can always come back to St. Louis <laughs> if we want to. So we drove and um, it was April when we started seeing green, evergreens and fresh air and I remember when we first, on I-90, our first exit was at 156th Street, close to um, Bellevue Community College. That was the address that we were given to drive to. We looked at each other and that was the decision automatically made. This is it. This is where we're going to live. As we're nearing the end uh, of this episode, would you share what your family life looks like now? Uh, we can share about, if you want to share about your family as well and mm -hmm. let us know what it looks like now What and, and also what you guys ended up doing for work. All these years and I think that'd be good for people to know too. We continue to live our life. We had kids. 
um, we started looking for work. Leo was not shy of finding jobs, no matter what, he will work. Um, he started doing janitorial jobs in the evening, night time. Many, many times I joined him and I will go with him, um, with Ada, holding hands and um, and I believe pregnant. he also worked with my dad doing janitorial work yes. back yes, then. Yes, Leo recruited your dad, <laughs> eager to work as well, and he took anything just to, yes, that's how we connected with your family. How many kids did you end up having? So uh, we had three additional children after Ada here. They were all born here. Um, and for seven years, uh, we remain in Washington State. We got our citizenship, and five years after, we were so proud, so proud, and so humble, and so honored to become U.S. citizens. And we had to take Ada to the interview. So, of course, she was very young, and the um, um, <clears throat> person there that was doing the interview wanted to include her in the interview because she was an immigrant as well. <laughs> so um, he asked her if um, she knew who was the president at the time. And at the time when we took our um, citizenship, it was Bill Clinton. So she knew that. <laughs> um, so seven years later, we embarked on a long trip to Europe we loaded a full um, container with our semi van or a van mm -hmm. and Vio's friend that they crossed the border with, with his family. So there were two vans and a lot of stuff in those cars. And we, we flew to Hamburg and then from there we spent about two months in Europe. Wow. Just revisiting all revisiting the... Revisiting after seven years. So, wow. yeah, three more kids after. And we work hard. We were not running away from any opportunity to make our life and our kids' life better. To this day, we're grateful and honored and humbled to live in this country, to be given this mm -hmm. chance and opportunity. And so what does your family life look like now? We grew as a family uh, in time. Um, we added to the family after Ada, we uh, were blessed with Tis, our first son. And of course, he was so excited. <laughs> Uh, a year later, we had Eddie, and then uh, four years after that, uh, Genevieve joined us. So we're all excited and happy. Um, now, it's grown Ada's even married more. <laughs> is growing even more. Ada's been married for quite a while with two boys, two kids, Theo and Max, who I have the pleasure and honor to be called Uni, <laughs> Grandma. Uh, I love them dearly. And Thies and Brie, they also have a baby boy, Remy. They went through some losses. We lost Levi, another grandson, so stillborn. Um, we enjoy Remy very much. Um, Theo, unfortunately, did not had the chance to meet Remy. Um, Genevieve is married as well. Um, Chris, they live here with us on the same property. And Edward, Eddie, dating a beautiful girl. That's awesome. And what about you, Ada? Do you, you mind telling us about your, your little family? Yeah, so I married TB, who our families actually met in Missouri. They um, 
I don't know if they were established for much longer than we were. Uh, they invited us over for lunch after church one time. And uh, the story is that um, his mom had asked him to share his toys with the new little girl that was visiting. And so he gave me a pink elephant, which ironically, on Valentine's Day after we had been dating years later, had no idea about the first story. He gave me a pink elephant because I love elephants. And um, yeah, over other various animals that I was going through an elephant thing. <laughs> And so he gave me a pink elephant, and that's when we heard the story for the first time. Wow. Um, so, yeah, his childhood sweetheart, basically, been married for 12 years, 13. I can't keep track. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we have the two boys. They're awesome. They're the best. They were, yeah, answered prayers and just we're grateful. That's awesome. Yeah. As we're at the end here, um, do you have uh, any closing thoughts, anything that you uh, want to uh, leave with the audience, with your families? Um, you know, the, the point of this podcast is to encourage people, motivate people, and ultimately make people feel more grateful for our lives here. And, um, you know, every time we have a guest, they have a slightly different story. And, and I feel like... Uh, it is, it is an honor to do this. And so I just want to say thank you to you guys. And as we're here at the end, is there anything you want to share? First, I have overwhelming gratitude. It was a big risk that you guys took. And I know it was all with us in mind. Um, it's just the life we've lived so far, and there's still so much life ahead that um, has been so beautiful and so blessed and just favored. I really, um, thank you. <laughs> That's the first thing. This opportunity to share <clears throat> my mom's story, my dad's story has been just an honor. And I'm so grateful and a little bit sad that we didn't get a chance with my dad. I hope that people get out of this to, um, talk to their parents, to friends and learn their stories, what they've been through, where they come from. Because it really, it just brings a lot into perspective. It makes you grateful for um, where you are in life <clears throat> and what people went through for you. Um, my dad, so many good things to say about him. He was a true trailblazer. He always set the path, always making a way for somebody else ahead, you know, behind him and always just preparing that. He, that's, I'd say, his legacy that he has left behind. Um, he was always working so hard, always with just, there was more. There was never, a, he wasn't afraid to try anything. He would say, what's the worst that could happen? You know, you you fail, you try again, you can make more money you can try again you can whatever you learned that that didn't work out and then you move on what's the worst that could happen and he would always tell us too if i could come to this country with 50 dollars in my pocket and have the life that we have now there's nothing you can't do with every opportunity that we have every we're so spoiled <laughs> that's the only thing i can think of and i'm just so grateful that we have this chance that we ended up where we ended up because I was able to meet my husband and make the life that we have. And, you know, yeah, we went through really hard times losing him. And we learned a lot, though, through that. And I think he's still teaching me um, to be strong, even though there's hard days where we miss him a lot. Um, but I know he, he really wants us to just keep going, keep pushing. I'll see him again. So I, that's the biggest lesson I've learned is just give life everything you have. There's only one chance at it. Um, really, and that's one thing I said at his funeral and that it truly meant is that he packed in twice as much life as anybody else would have, you know, 100 years in his 50 eight years he was alive 
He lived life so full. Even though it was hard, there was a lot, you know, struggle. And it wasn't easy coming to a country not knowing the language, finding job, being able to support a family, buying a home two years after being here. Like, just so many great accomplishments. And he still found ways to enjoy life. And really just... He... I don't know. I mean, he was an exceptional person. <laughs> and... There's just so much. I yeah, have so much love and respect for him and the life he led. And I just hope that he continues to teach others. You know, we found that he left a huge impact and a big legacy on not just our family, but after his accident, hearing um, what an impact he left on other people. People coming with stories and just memories and random things that we would have never, like, I mean, I would almost be like oh he's talking to my friends again you know and I'm like oh they're stuck and trying to save them but he was giving them advice and he was so genuine every time always he was not one for small talk he cut right to the chase what are you doing with your life and like okay so we're having this conversation and um he was just a real person and he really took every single day and made the most out of it so that's all i can say and hope we do that too well, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Sure. Thank you for doing this. Mm -hmm. I, I really appreciate it. First of all, I want to say thank you, Flavius, for giving us the chance to tell our story. And again, you're a wonderful team that spent so much time and to make this possible. Truly, truly appreciate it. I want to say that Vio and I appreciated so so much this chance that we were given to live in this country to learn so many new beautiful wonderful things the opportunity to have our kids and grandkids in a one the most wonderful country in this world and I would like to say for everyone that is listening to this, not to take it for granted. This is so special, and there's no other place on this earth so far like this blessed country. Vio and I came with a dream, and we got more than our dream, more than we dreamed of. So giving up, it's not an option. Like Ada mentioned, Vio was always the guy that will knock at any door that needed to be open. And we know very well, so is your dad and your mom. And so many others like us. Just the fact that we're here and we live healthy and we got to know so many wonderful people and ways of life that make our life greater than we even imagine. Any um, anything else you want to address with Vio? Oh, with Vio, yes. I want to say that I'm so grateful, first of all, to God for giving us this opportunity. He made this possible. And then from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you for making this possible. He truly made this possible. It's going to be missed. We would wonder how life would have been if he would have been here. But we know the life goes on and we have to keep going. And he taught us that many, many times. Yeah. You fall, you get up. So again, like Ada mentioned, we have one shot at this life. And we better do the best we can. And we all decided that that's what we're going to do. And we will see you again. Well, um, I just, 
again want to say thank you to you for being willing to share. Uh, it's, it's not easy. It's I can't imagine after everything you've gone through to even relive it. You know, it it, it could not have been easy. And so, thank you for your willingness to be transparent and open. Um, but I believe your your story will inspire, motivate, and encourage so many people. And it will give others a voice to want to share their stories, to pass on from generation to generation. And, um, so thank you for being willing to do that. Thank you for sharing. And um, I, I know there's, there's, a, there's a famous quote that says, like, all men die, but not all men truly live. And when I think of Vio myself, I've known him my whole life too. That's what I think of. He lived. And so um, I think your his legacy is going to live forever. And uh, your family will carry that on. And so um, thank you guys again. Really appreciate it. Um, um, now you, the audience, um, thank you for uh, listening and watching. Um, it is, uh, it is an honor to share these kinds of stories. And so if you have a story out there that you want to share that you believe will encourage and motivate and uh, inspire people, please reach out to us. Uh, help us share your story. Um, thank you for watching Pursuit of Freedom, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, really appreciate you guys so much. And um, I'm... Uh, I'm Really excited to get this to you guys. How are you feeling? I don't wish him to be here. Yeah. Me too. Yeah, me too. But I think this is such a great way to honor him, especially in this room, you know, and, um, how did you pick this? <laughs> I we, thought it's dark. I thought it's... <laughs> no, we, we came up here. We looked in every room. We literally looked in every room, and both of us were like, this is the room. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I think this is going to be such a cool story for you guys to have for your for life. <laughs> your, kids, your kids will watch one day and hear the yeah. whole story. I can't wait to show them. They always ask. Wow. And so thank you. Thank you for being willing to do this. I know it's not easy and a lot of emotions and and yours has a lot of layers of emotions. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so um thank you guys.